Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Modern Maker Workroom. Now, a few episodes ago, I showed you how I got dressed in a 17th century suit. And my undergarments for that suit were a pair of underbreeches made out of linen and a white linen shirt. Now, the thing is, I got a lot of questions about those underbreeches because for many people they were something they hadn't seen before. Now, we know that they had underbreeches in the 15th and the 16th century, early 16th century, and we know they wore them in the 18th century. So just the way that fashion works, there isn't going to be like a magic gap where something stops happening if you find it both before and after in the fashion timeline. Generally speaking, they change shape over time, but people are people and they tend to like to keep things the same, especially when it comes to the inside of their clothes. So these underbreeches are something that there is a little bit of a dead spot in terms of surviving garments and imagery which shows them. But thankfully we have two completely different surviving pairs. We've got a pair that looks like a pair of linen Venetians, like the ones that I showed you. And then there is also a style that appears like briefs. So I wanted to do a brief tutorial on how they're made. Now, here's the thing. The pair that I make in this video has no side seam. It is cut like one big piece of fabric from center front to center back. You cut two of them, you sew the crotch seams, and then you sew the inseams, and then you finish the top and bottom. Uh, but the pair that's in the Vieques Museum is actually uh, cut like a pair of Venetians. So it has out seams, it has gussets set into the bottom of the out seam. And so I actually made a pair and I'll show them to you at the end of this video. But the, the surviving garment is actually a little bit different from what I decided to make. And I really paid the price to be honest because they don't fit very well. They are not comfortable. Here's the pattern for the pair that I made in the getting dressed video. It's simple, it's elegant, and honestly, if I had made it just a little bit more full at the top and at the knee, it probably would have been fine. But I didn't, and that's just the way things happen. So I'm gonna go ahead with the construction of this. Most of this is exactly the same as it is for the other pair that you'll see at the end. Once it's cut out, we'll begin by sewing the crotch seams, and this is done with a back stitch. Uh, I'm doing everything with a linen thread, and you'll see me go by really fast. First we do the back crotch, then we'll do the front crotch, then we press them. And first I'll give a nice quick press just to flatten all the stitches into place, and then they're folded up. And once they're folded up, then they're rolled down a second time, and the whip stitches are used to hold it in place. And they should make just nothing but tiny little specks on the outside. We're not talking you know, big, grandiose stitches. The back crotch is done first, and then the front crotch is done second. At this point here, I just give the linen thread a quick little press before stitching with it because it makes it a little bit easier to work with. And to fell these seam allowances down, I'm using these teeny tiny little whip stitches that make just the tiniest little speck on the outside. And it's important to make sure that the stitches are strong and small because, see here, these are your linen under breeches. They're going to take so much wear as you use them. It's really important to make these seams very sturdy. And these are exactly the kinds of seams that are used on the original. In this little shot, you can see that I pinned the uh, pinned the end of the work to my shirt, and I'm kind of holding it in front of me. Because since I'm doing a whip stitch, it's easier to run my hand right to left. So if the garment is pinned to me and I'm just holding it out with my left hand, then I can use my right hand to take these nice small whip stitches and go real fast. The inseam is the next bit that we do. Um, we'll start by lining up the crotch seams at the inseam and then we'll begin at one end and start making our back stitches all along the seam. Now remember we're using a full dedo width of seam allowance, so a full finger width of seam allowance because it has to be rolled on top of itself and felled in place. Now 
Now, I really would like to work faster, so I'm securing the end of my linen onto the iron board that I use, and that way I have tension to pull against, and it really helps me make my stitches faster and uh, more accurate and much stronger, too, because I can pull a little bit tighter and know that I'm not distorting the fabric. So this takes quite a while because it's a very long seam. You go from knee to knee through the inseam. Once the back stitching is complete, then all the seam allowances are pressed to one side. I tend to press toward the back, but sometimes I'll press toward the front too. It looks like I'm pressing toward the back in this instance. Once it's pressed, then I turn it a second time, and then once again use the whip stitch uh, to complete. Once the inseam is done, then I turn my attention to the center front edges. So we roll the center front edges twice, and then we hem them in place. Very basic, it's just putting a turned hem. I think I finished it about a quarter of an inch. Uh, and I used a very strong secure whip stitch at the base of the opening to really help hold it in place because there's a couple of raw edges on the inside and you really don't want to see them. So I made sure that they're nice and secure. In this shot, you can see that they're mostly assembled now. All I have left is the waistband and the knee opening. Now, if you are making the other style, which has a pattern at the end of the video, you'll wanna make sure that you stitch your out seams before you start the rest of the process because we don't have an out seam. It wasn't shown at the beginning of the video. The waistband I cut in two pieces just because it was really efficient. So I have to sew the center back seam of this. And so I just do that with really quick back stitches. Then I press it open and then I press one edge up so that I have something to hem down. And before I finish, I wanna just measure this out and the length should be M, I, and a little bit. Now, I made a clip at M so that I know right where the center front edge is supposed to go. And then I make another clip at Q, and that gives me where the side seam mark is supposed to be, and that way I can line them up properly. In this shot, you see me just laying in some pleats, and they're just very evenly distributed around the garment. This one has fewer pleats on the front than it does on the back, and as I mentioned earlier, in retrospect, I really shouldn't have done that. Uh, but you'll see, at the very end of the video, you'll see the proper pair that's done correctly with all of the pleats. Once everything's in place, then I just use back stitching to sew the waistband on, then I fold it down, and then I fell the inner edge in place, just like all hemmed waistbands and bindings. For the leg opening, I will take a piece of twill tape, and the reason I'm using this specific herringbone twill tape is because that's what the extant piece has and uh, I wanted to make at least some effort to make this like the extant piece since I stupidly made so many um, irrational choices for no real reason other than I just felt like doing something different and then they didn't work and I learned my lesson. So the uh, twill tape is sewn into a ring and then it is stitched on to the edge. Once that's complete, I have both legs to do and uh, I'll finish them completely and after that then I have to make the tie because the waist has eyelets at center front and there needs to be a tie to hold it together so the first thing I'll do is stitch the eyelets and that's really easy you just stretch it open and then whip stitch the edge closed real tight and then you shove the awl back in a second time to make sure that it's nice and uh, stretched open and firm following that is now the lacing cord now this is done with a finger loop braid technique. I'm using five uh, strands or five bows, what they call, and uh, make sure you secure it really tight. There's plenty of YouTube videos to show you how to do finger loop braiding, so I'm not gonna show here. Once it's really going, you just keep the process up and uh, you know one hand will shift up and then the other hand digs through the loops on that hand and they trade back and forth and you just end up making this braid. All of that work and I end up with, you know, 14, 16 inches of braid so that I can tie my pants closed. But I've got my linen under breeches here and... Hold the phone. Mistakes have been made and let me tell you about them. They don't look right. They don't fit right. They are painted 
on. See, I really made a mistake when I made those choices. If I had made it just a little bit more full at the top and at the knee, it probably would have been fine. This is the pattern of the corrected version that I drafted based on the pair that's in the Rieks Museum. And you can see that it has a gusset at the out seam, it has an actual out seam, an inseam, the crotch depth is longer, there's more fullness in the waist, there's fullness in the knee. There's every one of these elements that makes them ultimately a heck of a lot more comfortable. And let me tell you, when I put them on to try them out after I finished them, it was immediately evident to me just how bad my mistakes had been on that first pair. Thank you so much for watching, and I really hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Modern Maker Workroom. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Happy stitching, everyone.